Welcome. Today we're going to talk about natural disasters and complex humanitarian emergencies and the relationship with health. By the time you finish this session, you should be able to speak comfortably about key terms that relate to complex emergencies, the importance of complex emergencies to global health, the characteristics of natural disasters and complex emergencies, the impact of those emergencies on the health of affected populations, some of the measures that might be taken to mitigate or address these impacts. Let's begin with a few vignettes to help us get a better picture of the links between natural disasters and complex emergencies in health. Javad lived in the Pakistani province of Kashmir when the earthquake hit. All the buildings in his village were destroyed. Hundreds of people in the village were killed, mostly as a result of being buried in the rubble. Many other people were badly injured from rubble falling on them. Their injuries were overwhelmingly orthopedic in nature. As the earthquake destroyed the village, it also destroyed wells, a health center, and roads leading to and from the village. Javad feared that many of those who were injured would soon die. As the Civil War spread in Rwanda, Sarah and her family fled across the border to what was fast becoming a gigantic refugee camp in Zaire, now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Although the camp workers did what they could to help the refugees, the circumstances at the camp were not good. There was little shelter, little water, and little food. In addition, a cholera epidemic spread through the camp not long after Sarah's arrival there. It hit the camp especially hard and led to a large number of deaths. As we begin to explore natural disasters, complex emergencies, and the relationship with health, let's look at some key terms. And I'm really going to focus largely on two, uh, as you can look yourself uh, at the others as well. Let's, let's keep going, Lindsay, if that's OK. The two on which I wish to focus are refugee and internally displaced persons, because it's really important to understand the difference between them. A refugee is a person who's outside of his or her country of nationality or habitual residence. They have a well-founded fear of persecution because of their race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, and they're unable or unwilling to avail themselves the protection of that country or to return there for fear of persecution. If someone leaves Rwanda during the Civil War and flees, left and fled to Zaire, they would be refugees in Zaire. There's a certain international protection uh, that's accorded to them. By contrast, an internally displaced person is someone who's been forced to leave their home for reasons such as religious or political persecution or war, but they've not crossed an international boundary. They don't have the same status uh, internationally or legally as refugees do. And this is very important to note when one is thinking about complex humanitarian emergencies uh, especially. Now, let's talk about natural disasters separately from complex humanitarian emergencies. There are a number of different types of natural disasters, as you know. There's drought, there's hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones, earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis, for example. When one thinks about natural disasters and their relationship with health, generally one can say the following. Earthquakes kill the most people and also leave a lot of people injured. Volcanoes don't kill that many people usually, but they can also have a destructive impact, but they can often have a destructive impact from mud and uh, from ash. Tsunamis can cause a substantial amount of death, generally from drowning. When we're thinking about the groups that are affected, uh, the poor are usually more affected than better off people because of the circumstances better off people living in safer parts of town, safer parts of, uh, 
of a, a, a city having more means and ability to take care of themselves, etc. About 90% of the deaths every year from natural disasters actually occur in low and middle income countries. It's also important to note that natural disasters have indirect effects, of course, as well as direct ones. And natural disasters can have, do substantial harm to infrastructures such as water, sanitation, health facilities, or uh, roads. And people can die and do die from the direct effects of these natural disasters. But especially in low-income countries, they also can die from the indirect effects of these, such as uh, epidemics which might occur in a camp-like situation or might occur even elsewhere. Most of the effects of, some of these natural disasters are relatively short-lived, though they can be uh, longer-lived, like the earthquake in Haiti, for example. And being very young, very old or sick, when one has to flee a place that suffered a natural disaster uh, is not good and it's a risk factor for um, not surviving or thriving as a result. When we think about the burden of disease and death, it's been estimated that about 31,000 people died in 2011 from natural disasters, about, two th about 10,000 people in 2012. However, um, more than 250 million people worldwide were estimated in 2012 to have been affected by a natural disaster. When we think about complex humanitarian emergen emer emergencies, uh, these usually relate to conflict, such as in Syria today, or earlier in Sudan, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Bosnia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. When we speak generally about complex emergencies, we can say they generally kill people more than natural disasters do. They can go on for a very long time. They often include fundamental assaults on human rights, such as rape, torture, and the intentional killing of humanitarian workers. They might also include the intentional destruction of health facilities. And like natural disasters, they can have indirect effects such as the breakdown of water, sanitation, health facilities, and roads, and not just direct effects. These complex humanitarian emergencies are often associated with large numbers of internally displaced people and large numbers of, um, of refugees. This graphic looks at some examples of countries that have refugees and internally displaced peoples had in 2015. And we see the really substantial numbers of refugees living in a number of countries. Here's the country in which they're living, the estimated number of refugees, and the countries uh, which were the source of those refugees. Here are countries that have internally displaced people. Here is the number of those displaced people. And um, the number of such refugees and internally displaced people is certainly striking. And what we know is that many of these refugees will never return to their native place. And many of these internally displaced people uh, will find it difficult to return to their native places as well. Now, it's been estimated that 320,000 to 420,000 people a year die as a result of complex humanitarian emergencies. But it's important to understand that perhaps contrary to the popular myth, very, a very small share of these is due to direct trauma. Most of these deaths are due to indirect causes, undernutrition, uh, epidemics, and things like that. Uh, the people who die varies with the type of emergency. In some circumstances, what we find is that there's a real excess of young child deaths early in the emergencies, but it tends to um, get smaller over time. Uh, we also find that in some situations, like the Bosnian conflict, the overwhelming share of those who died were men of fighting age, men between 19 to 50. We also see in these circumstances um, substantial excess deaths from diarrhea, measles, uh, lower respiratory infections, malaria, and cholera is often a problem too, 
especially in refugee camps like those that um, were in place after the conflict in Rwanda. And nutrition, of course, is always a really central concern when people are displaced, trying to ensure that they are adequately nourished and trying to ensure as well that people with less power, like women and young children, can actually uh, get the food that they might need. Violence against women and rape as a weapon of war is also uh, almost shockingly common in many conflicts. 25% of the women in East Timor reported, for example, that they had been sexually assaulted during the conflict there. And we also know that complex humanitarian emergencies and conflicts can often be linked to mental health issues, especially post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. Now, it's not easy to address the health impact of natural disasters and complex emergencies or to prevent them from occurring. But some measures can be taken to mitigate the effects of natural disasters. One can have better building standards. Uh, one can build seawalls and levees to prevent flooding. Uh, the public can be become better educated about how to deal with natural disasters and plans can be made for dealing with them. And in fact, Bangladesh, which is a country that frequently faces flooding, uh, has been held up by many as a model for some of these efforts. When dealing with complex humanitarian emergencies, it's important very early on to assess their impact on health and continuously to try to identify through surveillance when there are problems and how they can be acted on. It's also very important in these circumstances to immunize all children against measles, to ensure adequate nutrition, and to try to prevent cholera, especially in uh, refugee situations and camps like those that occurred after the conflict or during the conflict in Rwanda. And it's valuable for you to understand that as surveillance is being carried out, that an important rule of thumb is that when the crude mortality rate is twice the, the normal, when the number of people dying per 10,000 people in a certain setting is twice the normal and expected rate, it suggests to public health uh, practitioners and providers that a public health emergency exists within the setting uh, that's resulted from this complex emergency. There's been some important and valuable progress in setting standards for responding to natural disasters and complex health uh, humanitarian emergencies such as the International Red Cross Code of Conduct and standards for the provision of services through the SPHERE project that talks about when you're dealing, for example, with a refugee camp setting, how much food per day do people need, how much water per day do people need, uh, how much shelter uh, should be provided as well. And yet there remain important challenges in the ability of both domestic and international actors to respond to such disasters and emergencies quickly, efficiently, in a coordinated way, and in a manner that takes account of the best evidence about what works at least cost. I hope after this brief introduction in natural disasters and complex humanitarian emergencies and some of their relationships with health, that you have a better sense than you did before of the links between natural disasters, complex emergencies, and the health of the people living in different places. You've seen that the health impacts of these events vary with the type of event. You've also seen that these effects can be direct or indirect, and that some have a relatively shorter uh, impact and some have relatively longer effects. You've also learned that countries can take measures to mitigate the, some measures to impact, to mitigate the impact of natural disasters and complex emergencies and to address them more effectively and more efficiently when they do arise. In the next session, we're going to talk about emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases and antimicrobial resistance.